They have been living all their lives in a perfect society, free of war and crime, environmentally restored, and prosperous beyond the dreams of pre-tribulation man. And yet, when Satan is released, he will apparently have no problem deceiving many of them into thinking that Yahshua is somehow treating them unfairly, being unduly harsh with the rebels who occasionally pop their heads up, or that he's otherwise unfit to be their king. They will have absolutely no frame of reference, of course, except for the horror stories that are told of what life was like before he returned, or as Satan will put it, took over. These disgruntled citizens, with little satanic suggestion, will find it intolerable that their leaders have to bow to the king and honor his people, the Jews, showing their faces every year at the Feast of Tabernacles. And what is it with those animal sacrifices they've got going on at the Jerusalem temple? They're barbaric and old-fashioned, blah, 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 blah. They'll swallow Satan's bait, hook, line, and sinker. After all, he's the one who, upon finding himself the best angel in the universe, decided that wasn't good enough. He wanted to be like God. He's the king of discontent. Why does John call them Gog and Magog? Are the rebels Scythian hordes? Are they Muslims like the last time? No, but they'll follow the same incredibly stupid game plan. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. That's right, they're going after the Jews. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Can you believe it? It's the unbattle of Magog all over again. The only positive element I see here is that Israel, for once in their lives, are not part of this rebellion. This time they will be impervious to the devil's trickery. If I were a betting man, I'd wager that not a single Jew will be deceived. So, what's going to happen to Satan this time? Another thousand-year stint in the Huskow? Nope, he's a three-time loser. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20, 7 through 10. That's a life sentence, if you can call it living. No more possibility of parole. 700 years before Christ's first advent, Isaiah saw it unfolding. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. This is the only time in the entire Bible where Satan's name is mentioned. The Hebrew word, if we take Strong's acceptance of the Masoretic text vowel points as reliable, is Halel, meaning the morning star. But the word from which this is derived, and perhaps the actual word itself, since the consonants are identical, is halal. To be clear, to shine, which has a second, less flattering connotation as well. It can mean to make a show, to boast, hence to be clamorously foolish, to stultify. Webster defined stultify to make or cause to appear foolish or ridiculous, to reduce to foolishness or absurdity, to render wholly futile or ineffectual. (laughs) The next time you're tempted to give Satan any credit or respect, remember that. By the way, halal in Arabic means moon god, a proper definition of Allah. If you didn't know before, you do now. Allah and Satan are one. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. A euphemism for angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Sorry, big guy, you're a couple of dimensions short of deity. This is like Goofy announcing that he's going to draw a Walt from now on. It's absurd. Isaiah had his number. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the abode of the dead, to the lowest depths of the pit. 
Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. We're going to be discussing Sheol, Hades, Hell, and the Lake of Fire later. But for now, notice that Satan and the men he deceived into doing his bidding, those who see you, are all going to be together in the pit. But his prisoners seem to be in a different category. Satan, he who seemed so formidable when he roamed the earth, roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, will be an object of scorn and derision in this brave new underworld. Forget the odd idea that hell is Satan's realm. He's merely one of the inmates, toothless and impotent. The demons, and no doubt Satan as well, know that their judgment is coming, and they have some idea as to when. This is illustrated by an encounter that took place near the Sea of Galilee. When Yahshua had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Matthew eight twenty eight and 29. The demons inhabiting these poor guys knew Yahshua, and they knew he would torment them at some future point. But they were pretty sure they had some time left before their ultimate judgment day, and Yahshua did not disagree. We aren't specifically told, but it's reasonable to assume that this judgment day occurs at the same time as Satan's, which we just saw. The devil was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10 Some demons are loose in the world today, but some really nasty ones, as we have seen, have been locked up in the abyss where Satan cooled his heels for a thousand years, awaiting their doom. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude 6. Peter concurs. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. That's Tartaros, the deepest part of Sheol or Hades. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Second Peter 2, 4. This great day of judgment is scheduled for the end of the millennium. The timing, the idea that the final judgment of demons and men all takes place at the same time, is confirmed by Isaiah. It shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. The demons are not all earthbound as men are. They will be retrieved from their places on high, wherever that is, as the kings of the earth are brought together for punishment but they'll all share the same fate. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. After many days, they will be punished. Yahweh is letting his prophet know that evil will be allowed to run rampant upon the earth for many days, but not forever. Isaiah's parting shot is fascinating. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Isaiah 24, 21-23 Virtually every religion on earth from the dawn of time forward has incorporated some permutation of either sun or moon worship as a central pillar We have stumbled across this phenomenon dozens of times in previous chapters, from the Babylonians' Tammuz to the Romans' Mithras to the Muslims' Allah. The source of all this nonsense is Satan himself, Helel or Halal, Ben-Shakar, Lucifer, son of the morning. 
The morning star, of course, is the sun, the giver of light and life, or at least that's what Satan would like you to believe. Satan doesn't much care whether you worship him directly as the sun god, or venerate his reflection as the moon god, or worship a vague spirit of enlightenment, just so long as he can prevent you from focusing on the one true god, Yahweh. Here we see both the sun and the moon disqualified as God material, outshined by the source of all light sources, Yahweh himself. And what of those discontented millennial souls who took Satan's advice to go public with their heartfelt hatred of Yahshua? Paul once wrote, The Lord Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. 2 Timothy 4.1 That time has come. The last mortal has made his choice, demonstrating by his actions whom he believes and trusts, Yahweh or Satan. John saw it all. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. If you will recall a bit earlier, we read that the rest of the dead, that is, other than the millennial mortal, other than the millennial martyrs who were being resurrected there at the end of the tribulation, did not live again until the thousand years, the millennial reign of Yahshua, were finished. Now that the thousand years are in the history books, we see these people living again, so that they might experience judgment. And books were opened. This is the record of their words and deeds, their works. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, Revelation 20, 11 and 12. This isn't the first time the book of life is seen in scripture. As far back as the Exodus, it was understood that there was a heavenly book in which was recorded the names of God's people. Then Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And Yahweh said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Exodus 32, 31-33 Significantly, the names of people aren't added to the book when they're saved, but rather they're deleted, blotted out, when they choose not to follow Yahweh, or worse, choose to align themselves with Satan. Everybody starts out written in the book of life. You have to ask to be removed from the list. And as Moses and later Paul in Romans 9.3 found out, you can't relinquish your place in the book in the hope of saving others. It doesn't work that way. David's prayer was that his adversaries and prophetically messiahs would not enter the kingdom of heaven. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Psalm 69:28. Daniel foresaw the temporal deliverance of the faithful. At that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. Daniel 12:1. On the other hand, Yahweh put things into perspective when he taught that citizenship in the kingdom of heaven is far more significant than anything that transpires here on earth. Behold, I give you, the disciples, the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 19 and 20. The final mention of the book of life occurs in the last verse of the next to the last chapter in the Bible. There shall by no means enter the new Jerusalem anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 21, 27.